Hey guys, we're back and we're doing part 2 for paper 3H for math from June 2011. Sorry, paper 4H. Alright, so we left off at question 12. And 12.1 is just asking you to solve the inequality 2x plus 13 is greater than or equal to 6. Now, just solving an inequality is the same as solving any algebraic equation. So we're just going to do it the same way. So first of all, we're going to subtract 13 on both sides. This and this will cancel, and we're going to get 2x is greater than or equal to 6 minus 13, which is negative 7. Now we're going to divide by 2 on both sides. These two are going to cancel to give me 1. So 1x, or x, is greater than or equal to negative 7 divided by 2, which is negative 3.5. All right, question 12. 2 is telling you that n is a negative integer. An integer is just a whole number, like 1. 2, 3, but in this case it's negative, so it's negative 1, 2, 3, and so on. And write down all the values of n which satisfy 2n plus 13 is greater than or equal to 6. Now when we solved this in a previous equation, we got n is greater than or equal to negative 3.5. So n, the number n, should be greater than or equal to negative 3.5. So it can't be equal to negative 3.5, because first of all, 3.5 is not an integer. I told you an integer is a whole number. So it has to be negative, it has to be a whole number, and it has to be greater than 3.5, negative 3.5. So n could be negative 3, it could be negative 2, and it could be negative 1. It can't be 0, because 0 is not negative or positive, it's nothing. And it can't be 1 or 2 or anything else, because n is negative. So it's n is equal to negative 3, negative 2, or negative 1. Alright, question 13 is standard form, and it gives you the diameters of meters in meters of four planets, and it's in standard form, all the numbers. Now you have to figure out which planet has the highest, the largest diameter. Now to figure out which has the largest diameter, you have to first, what I look at is this number here, 10 to the power of whatever, because that's the number by which, because all of these numbers are pretty much like, um, so all, all of them are between 1 and 10, so it's, and they're the same format, so you just have to first look at this part. Now, the one with the smallest power, or like, for example, 10 to the power of 6, the one with the smallest power will definitely be a smaller number. So Mercury is out of the question, and Mars is out of the question. So that means that, it, like, you have to compare Venus and the Earth. Now, the Earth has 10 to the power of 7, Venus has 10 to the power of 7. So that means that, um, you have to look at these two numbers now. Now you have to look at which of the two numbers is greater. And the Earth's is greater, because it's 1.28. So that means that the Earth has the largest diameter. So the answer to A is the Earth. Alright, question 13B is asking you to write 6.79 into the tenth of the power of 6 as an ordinary number, meaning just a normal, regular number, not standard form. So just to do that, all you got to do is just move this six spots because when you multiply by ten you just move a spot so you're gonna get six seven nine zero 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 yeah this is pretty basic stuff I hope you guys know this alright for question 13 C you have to calculate the difference in meters between the diameter of Venus and the diameter of Mercury and give your answer in standard form so all you have to do is, the di to find the difference, you just got to do diameter of Venus minus diameter of Mercury. And that is just, look at, refer to the table, you're going to get 1.21 into 10 to the power of 7 minus 4.88 into 10 to the power of 6. Now just put this on your calculator, and you're going to get 7220000. Zero, zero. Now you have to give your answer in standard form. So simply all you do is you move it in. So you move the decimal point because this can be written as point zero. So you move the decimal point in one, two, three, four, five, six places to this spot until it becomes a number between one and ten. And then you write it as 7.22 into 10 to the power of the number of spaces you moved it in. So you moved it in one, two, three, four, five, six spaces. So it becomes 7.22 into 10 to the power of 6. 
All right, question 14 says that there are two supermarket price tickets and the two price tickets are mathematically similar and the area of the smaller ticket is 7 centimeters squared. So this is 7 centimeters squared and the, you have to calculate the area of the larger ticket. Now with math, mathematically similar shapes, um, we consider the ratio of their lengths. If you square them, that will be the ratio of their areas when they're math math mathematically similar. Okay, and it's just shown because like, for example, usually area is like, length is L and area is L times L. It's for that reason that we just consider the areas to be similar, to the ratio of the areas to be, the ratio of the areas to be the similar when they're mathematically similar. I'll just show it to you and you'll get it. So for example, the ratio of their lengths in this case is 2 is to 6, smaller sh uh, ticket to larger ticket. Okay? So it's 2 is to 6. So if I, was, if I was to find the ratio of the areas, all I would have to do is square both the lengths. Okay? And that will give me the ratio of the areas. If I want to find the ratio of their volumes, I'd have to cube the lengths. So in this case, I square the lengths to find the ratio of their areas. And what I'm going to get is 4 is to 36. And this is the ratio of areas. Okay? So for mathematically similar shapes, you can actually do this. You can take their lengths, you can square them, and you can find the ratio of the areas. Okay? Now, um, taking this ratio, okay, I'll just start a new uh, thing. So taking this ratio, 4 is to 36, and this is from smaller to larger ticket, um, we know the area of the smaller ticket is 7 centimeters squared. So we want to find out the area of the larger ticket. We'll call the area of the larger ticket x. Okay? So you can just use the, the put this algebraically, and you're going to get 4 over 36 is equal to 7 over x. Multiply both sides by x and multiply both sides by 36. You're going to get 4x is equal to 7 times 36. Divide both sides by 4. You're going to get x is equal to 7 times 36 over 4 which is just 63 centimeters squared. Now the reason you can equate their uh, ratios is because you're keeping the same ratio you established in the beginning, 4, four is to 36. So you're saying that if, this, if the area of this was 4 centimeters squared, the area of this would be 36 centimeters squared. So you're just keeping that same scale factor or scale for, the, for this area. All right, question 15a. Uh, you have to simplify this, and it's just basic um, division. So x minus 3 and x minus 3 squared, they'll actually divide by each other. Because, okay, actually, let me just expand it. Let me, first of all, write this fully, okay? So it's actually written as 8x minus 3, x minus 3, because x minus 3, the whole squared, over 4 times x minus 3. So x minus 3 and x minus 3 can divide by each other. 8 and 4 are divisible by each other, where if you divide the bottom by 4 and you divide the top by 4, you're going to get this as 1 and this will become 2. So it will become 2 times x minus 3, which is just 2x minus 6. And, yeah, that's it. So basically, 8 and 4 are divisible by each other, so 8 divided by 4 and x minus 3 and x minus 3 they cancel each other out. All right, question 15b. Before you do this question, you got to refer to this note over here. Now, this is an identity. Now, it's something you should know. Basically, what it says is that a squared minus b squared, it can be factorized into the form a plus b and a minus b. Now, knowing this identity, you can solve this question. So, in this case, you have a squared minus 144. Now you might be thinking, but this has nothing to do with this identity. Well, what I'm saying is that you can put it in this form of this, you can put it in this form here, and then factorize it. Okay? So, all you have to do is write a squared minus, now how can 144 be written as a square? It can actually be written as 12 squared. Alright? And now you have it in this form, where a is a, right? And b is 12. So you just got to do a plus 12 a minus 12. And that is your factorized form. 
Question 15C is asking you to make Q the subject of the formula. Now, before we do this, let's keep Q on one side so it doesn't get mixed up with the other terms. So to do that, we're going to add 5R on both sides. And we're going to get root Q is equal to P plus 5R. Okay? Now, we're going to square both sides. And we're going to get Q is equal to P plus 5R squared. And in this way, Q is the subject of the formula. Question 15B is asking you to solve for Y minus 4. 4 over Y minus 4 equals 5. Now you just got to solve for Y. So to do that, you're going to multiply both sides by Y minus 4. So multiply it by Y minus 4. So this and this are divisible by each other. And you're going to end up with 4 equals 5 times y minus 4. Now what I suggest doing is expanding these brackets, so I hope you guys remember how to expand brackets. 4 equals 5y minus 20. Now we're going to keep the y's on one side and we're going to keep the numbers on the other. So we're going to add 20 to both sides. So we're going to get, these two will cancel to give me 0. We're going to get 5y is equal to 24. So divide both sides by 5. You're going to get y is equal to 24 over 5, which is just 4.8. Alright, question 16, 1 and 2, I'm going to complete them together. It just says the incomplete histogram and, get, and table gives information about the people, ages of people in a village, so you just got to complete the histogram and the table. So, first of all, you need to be introduced to this thing called frequency density. And frequency density... I'll just say frequency D, is actually equal to frequency divided by class width. Okay, now you might be wondering what class width is. Class width is, for example, over here you have from 0 to 10. The width of this class is 10 because it goes from 0 to 10. Now the width of this class is just 15 minus 10, which is just 5. The width of this class is 15, and so on. Okay, 20, 25, and 5. Okay, so that's the class width. Now the frequency density is just, is just frequency over the class width. And in this case, the histograms are usually labeled frequency density against the other thing, which is this, like the, it can be height, it can be age, it can be whatever. So first of all, what we need to do is we need to establish we need to establish a scale for the y-axis. So we need to know what to label what in the y-axis. So for that, we need to find out the frequency density. So the only, uh, the only like, category in which both the frequency density has been, the frequency, the class width, and the frequency density has been labeled on the graph is this one. So we're going to calculate the frequency density of this. And it's just 60 over the class width, which is 5. And it's just 12. So the frequency density for this is 12. So that means if we find this on the graph, which is actually this bar over here, that means that this point here, sorry, this point here should be, have a frequency density of 12. Now, if you look closely at the graph, um, the, the graph actually uh, on your past paper, you can actually see that um, these are actually divided into one, two, three, four, it's been, actually been divided into six blocks, actually. I can't see them so clearly on the iPad, but I looked at the past paper and I saw it's been divided into six blocks. So that means that each small block should have a scale of two, because 12 divided by six is two. So that means that each um, like thick line should be labeled by two. And that's just using the same scale idea, because for six boxes it's 12, so for one box it must be two. Okay, so now we've labeled our frequency density, um, what do you call it, frequency density, we've labeled the y-axis, so we can start filling in the histogram as well as everything. So first of all, let's fill in the histogram. So over here, our frequency density is actually 100 divided by 10, which is just 10. And it's from 0 to 10, meaning our bar will start from 0 and finish at 10. So we'll go all the way up here. It'll go till 10, and it's going to, sorry, it's going to go across. So that's going to be our bar here. 
That's going to be one bar. Sorry if it's a bit untidy. It's I'm doing it on an iPad. Okay. So next, we're going to fill in this one here. So 50 to 75. So the the frequency density is actually 50 divided by 25, which is just 2. So we go again across from 2. So so it's right here, and we go across to 70. Five, and we go down sorry again it's really messy and that's one more bar and the final one the frequency for this one the frequency density is 20 divided by 5 which is 4 so again we go across from 1 2 3 4 5 we go across from here and we kind of draw a bar there sorry but you get the kind of idea I'm trying to go at okay now if we want to find out the the uh, we need to fill in, now we need to fill in the table. So if we want to find out the frequency, we can just rearrange this formula, frequency density equals frequency over class width. We can multiply both sides by class width, and we can get a formula, frequency equals frequency density times class width. So now we have the class width for this, let's do this one. We have the class width, and we have the class width being 15. And we know for that bar graph, it's from 15 to 30. So it's from here to here. It's this bar. The frequency density is actually 8. And the, free, the class width is 15. So it's just 8 times 15, which is a frequency of 120. And for this one here, so it's 120 here. And for this one, the class width is 20. So it's 20 multiplied by the frequency density and it's this bar over here the frequency density for this bar is actually 5 so it's just 100 so the frequency is 100 so yeah that's your completed histogram and completed table so the two values in the table are 120 and 100 and the histogram is a mess so I just refer to your textbook or something I mean I think you kinda get the idea just Label, label your whatever, your graph, your y-axis, then start plotting and you'll be fine. If you have any questions, just post them below in the comments section and I'll answer them. I'll do it on paper for you if you really need it that badly. Yeah. Okay, question 17 says this guy, Alan, has to attend a meeting on Monday and Tuesday. And the probability that he's late for a meeting is 1 over A. Now you have to complete this probability diagram in 17A. So first of all, to figure out, to complete the probability tree diagram, we have to figure out the probability that he's not late. Now since there are only two events, late and not late, and all probability adds up to 1, so that means that the probability of him not being late is 1 minus 1 over 8, which is 7 over 8. So the probability of him being not late is 7 over 8, and write that down on the probability branch. Now, for the Tuesday meeting, he can again have two possibilities coming from either possibility here for the Monday meeting. He can again be late or not late. I'll just say not L. And for be after being not late on Monday, he can again come on Tuesday and he can be late or he can not be late. And again, you label the respective um, probabilities. So it's 1 over 8, 7 over 8. Because probability of being late and not late won't change. So that's your completed probability tree diagram. Okay, question 17b asks you to calculate the probability that Alan is late for at least one of those meetings. Meaning, he's late for at least one or more of those meetings. Okay, so it can be either be he's late for both meetings or he's late for one meeting and not the other. Okay, so to do this question, you have to calculate all the you have to take into consideration all the events that could occur where he's late for at least one or more of those meetings. So if you think about it, um, on Monday he can be late and on Tuesday he cannot be late. So I'll say not be late is N, uh, N and late is L. And on Monday he can be not late and on Tuesday he can be late. And on Monday he can be late and on Tuesday he can be late. So in this way, he's late for more than at least one or more of those meetings. So these are the three events that could occur. 
Now if we find out the probability of each of these three events and add them together, that will give us the total prob probability that Alan is late for at least one of those meetings. Now first of all, we'll calculate the probability of this event occurring. So the probability of him being late than not late is 1 over 8, the probability of him being late, multiplied by 7 over 8, the other probability of him not being late. And that just gives you a total probability of 7 over 64. Now the same thing over here. The probability of him first being not late is 7 over 8. And the probability of him being late is 1 over 8. Again, that gives you a total probability of 7 over 64. And the probability of him being late both times is 1 over 8 times 1 over 8, which is 1 over 64. Now, adding all of this together, you'll get 7 over 64 plus 7 over 64 plus 1 over 64, which will give you a total probability of 15 over 64. And this is probability that he's late for at least one of those meetings. At least meaning at one or more. All right, so for question 18, you have to show the recurring decimal 0 0.396 is equal to 44 over 11. So to prove this, all you have to do is take this decimal and convert it into a fraction. Now these dots over here, they start here and they end here, meaning these three numbers are constantly repeated forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? So in this case, this decimal can be written as 0 0.396, 396, 396, and so on. It can keep going on forever and ever. So, let's say that this decimal, 0 0.396, 396, 396, is equal to x. Now, to convert it into a decimal, we have to make it into such a form where the repeated numbers are whole numbers. So, let me just show you what I mean. So, if I multiply this whole, this whole decimal by 1,000, right? So, 1,000 x, correct? If I multiply x, because if I multiply this number, that number is x, if I multiply it by 1,000, I'm going to get 396.396396 and so on, correct? Okay, now, if I subtract this 1,000x from x, what I'm going to get is 396. What I'm going to get is 900, sorry, 999x is equal to 396 because these decimals just get cancelled off with these decimals. And 1000 minus 1x is just 999x. Now if I divide both sides by 999, x is going to be equal to 396 over 99. 999, sorry. Now, if I divide both top and bottom by 9, you're going to get x is equal to 44 over 111. And this recurring decimal is actually proven that the recurring, de uh, this fraction actually proves that the recurring decimal is equal to that fraction. So, thanks for watching. Please comment if you have any questions, rate this video. And also, please importantly subscribe to this channel. It would like really mean a lot. And please watch the next part of the video tutorial. Thanks a lot, guys, and see you on the next part.